I'm Jeff Bryson, coordinator of the Cultural Studies Program here at Queen's. Uh, I'll begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anish Anishinaabe pe peoples. Um, Jan Allen, the director of the Agnes Etherington Gallery, has asked me to welcome you all here on her behalf and on the gallery's behalf and to thank our guests for coming from far and wide to make this panel. I'd also like to, on behalf of the organizers, uh, to personally welcome everyone to our panel discussion here today. Can artists really save the world? Exhibitions, exchanges, and other moments in Trojan horse diplomacy. I'll now turn things over to one of our two moderators, Dr. Sarah Smith. Thank you, Jeff. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists today. Uh, I want to first start on the far side of the panel with uh, Dr. Gerald McMaster, a Plains Cree and Blackfoot artist and curator who is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Visual Culture and Curatorial Practice at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto. A senior scholar in the field, Gerald has curated many prominent representative exhibitions of Canadian art at major international events. He was the Canadian commissioner to the Venice Biennale in 1995, at which the Canadian Pavilion featured the works of Métis artist Edward Portoise. He was the Canadian commissioner to the 2010 Biennial of Sydney and then artistic director of the 2012 Biennial of Sydney. And he is currently working with architect Douglas Cartonal, as well as David Fortin, to curate Unseated, an exhibition that is Canada's entry into the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennial. Our next panelist, uh, closest to me right here, is Dr. Richard Hill, who is an art historian, curator, and critic of Cree and other heritages. Richard holds the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Studies. On the opposite end of the country, he's come to us all the way uh, from Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver, and uh, a, a special debt of gratitude since he was also uh, rerouted through Detroit last night. So uh, we really should thank him for being here with us. Uh, Richard is working on a book about contemporary Indigenous art from 1980 to 1995. And many of you might know him because since 2016 he has published a regular column in Canadian Art Magazine, engaging in questions and controversies arising from the production, exhibition, and institutionalization of Indigenous art in the period. Through his writing, Richard has sought to establish a place for rigorous Indigenous art criticism. His work on the implications for Indigenous peoples of the professionalization and institutionalization of Indigenous artists extends well beyond national borders to the international context and makes him particularly well placed to contribute to our discussion today. Our next participant, uh, sitting beside Gerald, uh, Right there is uh, Nadia Meyer, a contemporary visual artist and member of the Kitigan Zibi and Anishinaabeg First Nation, who lives and works in Montreal. In her work, which many of you might know, Nadia employs collaborative processes as a strategy for engaging in conversations about identity, resilience, and politics of belonging. Today, she brings a practitioner's perspective to our panel, as she has been part of international exchanges supported by the federal government. Most recently, as part of Idiorhythmic, Canadian and Chinese Artists Urban Art Creation Project. This was a large Canadian and Chinese cultural exchange project, which included 15 Canadian and Chinese artists of national and international renown. Nadia has also participated in international biennials and residencies, and as a result, brings a wealth of experience to the conversation today. And the final panelist I'd like to introduce right here in the middle beside Richard is Kelly Langard. <laughs> Kelly is the Head of Partnerships in International Coordination at the Canada Council for the Arts in Ottawa. Kelly brings the important perspective of the arts administrator to our discussion today. She oversees the Canada Council's international projects under its new organizational structure and is well versed in the Council's leadership role at the international level. A recent initiative that's of particular interest to our discussion today uh, is the Council's work to organize and host the America's Cultural Summit in Ottawa uh, this year in the spring, May 2018. And this is a collaboration that they're undertaking with the Ministry of Culture of Argentina and the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies. 
This significant event, the summit will bring together cultural funders, policymakers, institutions, artists, practitioners, and diplomats from all across the Americas to discuss global cultural citizenship. And now I'd like to turn it over to Linda to get us started. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Jessup, and as you know, this is Sarah Smith. Sarah and I are affiliated with the Cultural Studies Program here at Queen's. I'm an Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts and Science, and Sarah teaches in the Communications and Media Studies Program at Carleton University. Sarah and I are also members of NACDI, the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, which along with the Agnes Etherington Arts Center and the Cultural Studies Program is hosting this event today. Now I know you're not familiar with NACDI, so let me introduce you. NACDI, North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, is a multidisciplinary partnership of academics, policymakers, and practitioners from North America and beyond who are interested in establishing cultural diplomacy as a critical practice. And our hope is that many of you will want to become involved as well. Interrogating and critically advancing cultural diplomacy, we aim to raise its profile as a tool in fostering international and intercultural relations. We want to mobilize it to connect North America globally, not merely as part of the soft power toolkit of nation states, but as a multi-directional and potentially activist practice that encompasses a broad range of non-state actors, including cultural institutions, arts managers, producers, consumers, and communities seeking to imagine counter-hegemonic possibilities and inclusive futures. One more thing. As a focus of NACDI's activities, North America, Turtle Island, serves as a vital geopolitical imaginary. It intersects with and links with other geopolitical regions and imaginaries, the global indigenous community, Latin America, the Asia Pacific, the Anglosphere, the French-speaking world, and others. And so it provides a means to engage with their networks and organizations, to become a network among networks. So, we hope to use the conversation today to put critical distance on the national as a privileged site of the particular. And to put critical distance as well between the contemporary artist and the historical avant-garde. That is, we want to counter unthinking celebration of the artist as the unfailing agent of social justice and of art is capable of affecting mutual understanding and tolerance that's going to save the world without the need to devote attention to the underlying political philosophy or economics underpinning the work of artists, critics, and curators. <coughs> so how does the Trojan horse reference in the title of our panel come into play? Are the activities of artists, curators, and arts organizers simply a vehicle to advance the interests of one state in another? Or do cultural workers use state-sponsored events as a Trojan horse in advancing interests of their own? What's the relationship? What are the tensions between art and artistic agendas and the foreign policy objectives of the states that support them? I asked the question, but of course I don't have the answer. That's something we're going to leave to discussion with our panelists today. And on that note, I'm going to turn things over again to Sarah. So in organizing this panel, we're hoping uh, to get a freewheeling exchange going, but we did circulate several questions to the panelists in advance. Uh, so we encourage uh, speakers to, to jump in when they feel they have something to say or hold back if they don't. Uh, but I wanted to start with the first question I had asked you all over email, which was, uh, as an artist, critic, curator, scholar, or administrator, how exactly do you see your work in the context of international cultural relations? And uh, whoever wants to start can, can feel free to speak to their experiences and projects to date. But I would encourage you all to use your microphones. <laughs> Thank you. you all look at me? <laughs> <laughs> Should be on, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> you introduced me as a, a Plains Cree and a member of the Siksika Nation of Alberta. So I guess I have to say cultural relations for me, international cultural relations or intra-cultural relations or intranational happened ever since I was born. I come from a First Nations and as you know, we live in a colonized country called Canada. So I engage almost all the time. <laughs> um, but as a Canadian citizen, let's put that way, with a passport, and traveling for many, many years uh, internationally, going 
to exhibitions all over the world, I think that uh, how you're treated abroad uh, often is quite interesting from a kind of um, perhaps a passive indifference, you know, when I was younger uh, to perhaps now maybe a bit more respect, okay? So there's that kind of uh, uh, moments that uh, I've experienced over time. Um, there, I remember one time when I was traveling with uh, an artist by the name of Edward Potra, who you mentioned uh, was around the time of Venice, and we were traveling through Holland. And I'd been to Holland once or twice before, and I knew how much the Dutch liked Canadians, so I said to Edward, I said, uh, you know, the Dutch really like Indians. And, he's, and I said, but if you're indigenous, I said, bonus, they really love you. <laughs> and, and it was that kind of situation, I think, of uh, traveling internationally, of being indigenous. Um, you're treated quite differently. You know, you're seen as a Canadian, of course, uh, but like any other Canadian, but once they find out you're indigenous, there's a, another level at play, so it's very difficult to say how uh, difficult it might be. Sometimes it's challenging, sometimes it's to your advantage. Um, but I think that uh, for me, uh, playing that role over the years um, and that kind of relationship as a curator uh, and taking exhibitions abroad uh, over the years, before 2000, I've taken, you know, before 2000, I took three exhibitions of Canadian artists abroad to, to Europe. Uh, two exhibitions, perhaps the United States. Uh, as a curator, I also brought American or other artists to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them was Jimmy Durham, who of course this year is coming to the Remy Modern in Saskatoon. So prior to the 19, 2000s, I would think that uh, that kind of relationship was kind of interesting, although we, you know, it was much more different after the year 2000. More artists now are traveling all over the world. Curators are all over the world. It's very, very different. But I also think that there might be something more recently in terms of that kind of international relations that isn't just, say, the Biennales, but there's a kind of relationship with uh, other indigenous communities around the world, you know, whether it's in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Scandinavia now with a lot of the Sami groups that are, uh, are there, uh, Asian communities, and now Latin American communities. So I think those kind of relationships are happening, okay? And I think that that's kind of the new directions uh, in these kind of international relations that are happening. So, uh, so as an indigenous person, as a curator, I've had those various experiences, and I'm now undergoing new experiences within this context, so. Does anybody else want to add to that? S speak about how they see their role? Yeah, Nadia? Um, well, I will add a little bit to that. <laughs> I've had um, actually a bit of an opposite um, experience uh, about exporting my indigenous art identity uh, to other places in the world, um, in particular in France and China, but also um, maybe even Athens. Or I, I feel like um, I'm operating invisibly in a certain way, and so uh, when you talk about what it means to be indigenous in North America, or how it is to be an Aboriginal person, or you bring in ideas of indigeneity in a place like France, uh, there's no understanding of what that is because they're still operating from a paradigm of um, really being, um, you know, in imperial, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and so that that creates a, a lot of um, diff and of course they say things like, well, we're all indigenous to here, and so that creates a lot of difficult understandings. The same in China. Um, uh, which was a, a really incredible experience for me, um, which I may get into a little bit later. But um, so I don't, I don't, I, I do, I do feel like there is across Canada um, in the last few years a real buzz 
and maybe that's also evidenced in the panel here, we're all indigenous, um, about how indigenous art is kind of like the great export mm -hmm. of Canadian art. But when you go anywhere outside of Canada, nobody knows who any of the artists are. They've maybe just, you know, um, two. <laughs> um, like Stan Douglas, who's not indigenous. So I, I think that there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a problem in translation of, uh, of what we're doing and how that's perceived outside of Canada. Um, and I do agree with you in that there is more space about you know, Sami artists and uh, what's happening in Latin America and, and in the US as well. Um, and there's still a lot of work and, and bridges to be done there. So. Thanks. Uh, well, I've been working on uh, international cultural relations at the council for about 10 years, and primarily in two areas, in uh, market development for Canadian artists and also in international relations and government relations. Um, on the market development side, our focus at the Council, because it's our mandate too, has really been focused on advancing the interests of artists, helping them develop their, um, their careers, their, their income, um, but also, um, also leadership and networks. And I think that that actually over the past number of years has become more and more important to me. Um, I really see this as one, as one area where we're not just, um, where we're working on, on long term uh, long-term success uh, for artists. So some of the things that I've done in terms of market development are delegations uh, of arts professionals to trade fair events or to art platforms like the Biennales or like the World Music Expo is another one we're involved in. Um, and then some of the other things we've done are, um, are to um, embed Canadian leaders, uh, arts leaders, emerging or mid-career often in uh, international networks like uh, the Sal Salzburg Global Seminars uh, Young Cultural Innovators Forum is one that we recently got involved with, um, or also the uh, Canadian Regional Fellowship Program for the International Society for the Performing Arts, which we've been involved in for many years. And what we've seen through those types of programs is that, is that um, Canadian arts leaders, not necessarily artists, but also <coughs> arts professionals, um, can be part of an, an international network and share ideas, share, uh, share resources, eventually collaborate, um, and really develop much more, um, uh, much longer term uh, success and also a uh, cross-cultural understanding. Um, so it's not really cultural diplomacy, but it's a, it's a, a you know, part of that. that cultural uh, relations, yeah. mm -hmm. which is supposed to be adjacent to cultural diplomacy, which is, yes, what cultural workers are seen to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so on the international relations side, um, we, I also have developed um, partnerships with other, other uh, arts councils internationally um, and also in exchange with, uh, regularly exchanging with colleagues at Global Affairs um, around some of the things that they're doing internationally that would be really more in the cultural diplomacy realm and we're often helping them to um, identify artists or to, to uh, understand how to work with artists. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm interested in, in talking more, Nadia, about, about um, how uh, artists and cultural workers go, go out internationally and also um, uh, reciprocate and, and how we can make those, those networks and those relationships uh, rich and about not so much about export or promotion of work, but more about um, uh, understanding and, uh, and collaboration and exchange. And I wouldn't be here at all if it wasn't if it wasn't Linda Jessup who asked me. To be honest, I wouldn't come to Kingston in January uh, for anyone else. Um, and thank you for all your support all, all these years. Um, I guess, uh, boy, I, I feel like there's so many ways to take this question. Um, and so maybe I'll just try to, you know, I could say an and also to to so many things people have said. Um, and I guess the the you know the one thing that I I would like to add as a a kind of complication is, um, and this is in a way a kind of paraphrase of something Jimmy Durham said a long time ago since we are mentioning him, um, but um, the, the problem with international um, is that presume, pre we like the inter, but we don't like what are we doing with the national part. And um, 
uh, in a sense, I've always struggled with nationalism uh, since I first learned what it was. Um, and I've struggled with that um, intranationally and internationally and internally in different communities. Um, and, and I think one, you know, one of the things that I've really been trying to think about in terms of how, how I might be in a conversation with other people in other parts of the world um, is whether there might not be a way to do it um, inter but also extra nationally um, without the framework of nation, uh, nation around it. Um, of course, that's a, that's a, uh, a political and institutional reality, um, but it's also, of course, a, a, a kind of uh, ideology. And I think it's, um, my position has often been, and maybe, you know, I always feel in a way that, uh, that I've struggled with um, the idea of diplomacy, I guess, for myself, because I've always struggled with the idea of um, who I might represent diplomatically, and a diplomat represents somebody. Um, and I've never felt entirely comfortable <laughs> as a representative. The only time I've ever been in a situation where I really felt like I had to take that on was when I was at the Art Gallery of Ontario, an experience Gerald and I shared in different ways. Um, um, when, um, when I was, uh, you know, tasked with uh, bringing uh, historical Indigenous art into the Canadian wing, uh, most more or less for the first time in a, in a substantive way, and it was the first time I realized that I was um, doing something that wasn't like the kind of critical work that I had been doing before as an art critic, as someone who was kind of writing from a, um, a bit of a perspective as an outsider, and suddenly you have institutional authority. And so um, immediately I realized, my god, I'm, I'm like responsible to what, everyone in Ontario, uh, <laughs> everyone in Canada, uh, certainly every indigenous community in a very special and particular way. Um, it's, para it's almost paralyzing, um, and so you just have to go and do, do things anyway. Um, but um, since leaving that position, I've always felt that my, 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 my job in international relations was to kind of subvert the idea of nationalism. And, um, and I, um, I really, that's, that's kind of the, the project that, I, you know, that I've undertaken in different ways. Um, and I guess the, you know, the, weird, the weird ways it plays out um, like, I'll tell one short story, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, this is also an AGO story. Well, there's two things. One, uh, a number of years ago, Jim Logan from the Canada, who was at the Canada Council then and who's a Cree artist, um, called me up and asked me if I wanted to be on a, a, a an Aboriginal territorial delegation to Venice, I think it was. It was like one of the first efforts the Canada Council made. And like an idiot, <laughs> I got really bogged down because I couldn't, I couldn't imagine who delegated anything to me. Um, I couldn't see how I could be a delegate. And so I, I just said to Jim, I don't know how to be a delegate. Like, I don't know how, who I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, who I'm representing there. Uh, I, you know, who, who in the community would say, let's send Richard Hill to be a delegate for the, for the Aboriginal community. I don't think anyone would do it. Um, and so, for that reason, I've never gotten any of those great trips <laughs> that anyone, uh, a lot of other people have. And I missed out on some opportunities to connect with people. And so it was, it was very foolish, but it, it, I, I got stuck on the idea. Um, but the other role of um, kind of official diplomatic role that I had at the AGO um, was um, when I was there, the AGO was involved in these partnerships, partnerships with the Hermitage Museum. Um, and there were a whole series of exhibitions that happened as a result of that. And the idea, um, this was all orchestrated behind the scenes by Canadian businessmen who wanted to do business in Russia and get connections with oligarchs or whatever you need to do to, um, to do that. And, um, and so um, the, these businessmen were basically funding all, all these exhibitions. And if you know how exhibitions usually work, um, you know, you you do partnership and each institution contributes something. Um, in the case of the AGO Hermitage partnerships, the AGO kind of and their sponsors paid for everything. 
and the Hermitage took our money and said thank you. Um, and um, of course this was all about something completely other than what it was seeming to be about. But the, the AGO was very insistent at the time that the, um, that the Hermitage receive a Canadian exhibition as well as send exhibitions to us. It was, and so we also paid for them to take our show. Um, <laughs> and it fell to me and Michelle Jakes and Anna Hudson um, to curate an exhibition of Canadian art that would go to the Hermitage. Um, and to me, this was a very perplexing position to be in. You know, you're doing a straight up diplomatic show. It was Vladimir Putin's early days, but you could really tell that that situation was already super corrupt. And uh, obviously that's why everybody wanted to get their nose in there, uh, so they could share, share in the corruption. And um, this is why you need to be outside to say these things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we came up with this idea of a show um, that was going to be based around, um, it was, a, I guess you could say, a Trojan coyote. It was going to be based around Edward Poitras' coyote sculpture. Uh, an amazing work that, um, that Gerald has curated, uh, which is uh, uh, this coyote who's made out of uh, the bones of seven different coyotes. is an amazing object. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, this idea of this trickster figure, which it was maybe a little bit overplayed at the time, but um, by that point. Um, but I thought this would be a kind of interesting figure because I, I, we imagined him as a kind of tour guide and he would give this like crazy, my essay was the kind of crazy trickster's tour of the exhibition and the history of Canadian art. And I thought this would be a nice way to, you know, kind of subvert the idea of a diplomatic show, but also sort of do something like a diplomatic show. Um, it probably wouldn't have worked, but um, as part of the exchange, um, they sent a curator over from the Hermitage to the AGO to meet with us and, uh, and talk about the exhibition. And as soon as he heard about <laughs> what we were planning to do, and, he's, and especially when he saw the Edward Poitras piece, he said, this is not an ethnographic museum. This is, you absolutely, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this. And so we went back and forth with him for a month and, uh, and uh, he visited, you know, he stayed with us and we talked to him and um, yeah, absolutely ended up that there was no way that this show could happen. And so in the end, Dennis Reed, who was chief curator at the time, and I guess Matthew got together and they said, well, let's just send the Tom Thompson show that was touring, and that's what they said. <laughs> <coughs> so that's my experience with official diplomacy. <laughs> um, but I guess that's, uh, that's also the, the kind of, uh, uh, um, the kind of position I've, I've tried to take around, uh, around nations that, uh, and with, kind of official national culture and all these kinds of things, which on one hand, they're political realities that we have to deal with. On the other hand, um, we shouldn't let them convince us that, um, that they're, they're our reality. Um, if we're going to have interrelations, um, there are all kinds of ways we can do that. And, and I really do feel like we're at a, this was going to sound ridiculously <laughs> overblown, but I feel as a, we're at a period as a species where we can't not think of ourselves globally. We can't not think of ourselves as a, as a world species. Um, and we have a terrible history of how to think of ourselves um, internationally based on the history of modernist thinking, and, uh, you know, where Europe kind of defined universal humanity and then projected it outward. Um, that was a terrible failure, um, but at the same time, I feel like somehow we need to be able to get into a conversation. Um, as, this sounds so as a species, we need to, internationally we need to be able to talk about, uh, talk to ourselves, and and come up with some way of uh, about thinking of who we are. And um, I hope that it's not all just about I'm this nation and we believe this, and um, and everyone is just kind of performing their you know their kind of already pre-appointed role. I think. We need to, you know, the world is changing, it's changing us, and, and we need to be able to Sometimes. deal with that novelty as well. Anyway, that's it. Well, that's a perfect segue into my first question. You've kind of answered it, oh, but this, I'll restate it, and then people can respond to you and the question. Um, a recent report exploring cultural diplomacy at the United Nations states simply, culture can be a Trojan horse for political messages. The authors are speaking to a conventional understanding of the use of culture at the international level, where culture is seen as a tool 
deployed by individual states to advance foreign policy initiatives, economic agendas, and military strategic alliances. Many scholars argue, however, that culture can carry the political messages of a broader range of actors and interests, even at the level of state-sponsored events, that the Trojan horse can just as easily be deployed by artists, curators, and administrators to smuggle in alternative agendas. We'd like to discuss the tensions highlighted by these contrasting understandings of the Trojan horse metaphor. As Richard pointed out, how do you see the various interests at play in the events you've been involved in? Um, how have you encountered these tensions? If you have, how have you negotiated them? Um, Gerald, you said, suggested that you might speak to this, and Richard already has, so maybe you could both respond to the question and to Richard. Okay. Um, Trojan horse. That's a Greek mm -hmm. story, a Greek... <clears throat> okay, this is Canada. And, um, Clive, you know where I'm from. I'm from North Battleford area. Um, and I come from a small town where I grew up called Fort Battleford. It's now called Battleford. So I want to use a more made in Canada metaphor about the fort <laughs> as opposed to the uh, Trojan horse. Um, and I think what has happened over the years is the storming of the fort. And I think that that, uh, uh, I have a couple examples here and I think that the uh, and I think that the notion of this idea is, is uh, something much more closer to home from what, uh, and I think that Richard just started it. And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples, because I think in, a, in the situation for me, it was uh, 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 institutions, okay? I think the institutions in Canada are, is the, are the forts. And um, so at sometimes I've often felt I've been uh, the, the Trojan horse, okay? Uh, very early on, I came to Ottawa as a young curator. Uh, here I was at a national institution, and what was I doing here? You know, I was, I was uh, uh, working uh, with artists. Uh, in those days, uh, there was no choice but to work in an ethnographic museum because uh, uh, no art museum in Canada were taking indigenous artists seriously. Mm -hmm. And so uh, somehow there were friends in the ethnographic museum. Uh, but at the same time, that's where a lot of the uh, objects, our objects, our, our ancestors' works were in those institutions. They were called ethnology. Uh, but I never liked that term. <laughs> uh, because it's a way of looking at something ethnographically, right? And I, I, I think it was having been looked at from that point of view have, has often been troublesome for me. And so being there actually in an institution surrounded, and Edward, again, I use Edward Putra, and I think uh, Richard and I are using Edward and Jimmy, uh, you know, as much as we possibly can because I think they're wise artists and they've said some really interesting things. I remember one time Edward says, you know, because uh, I asked him, I said, what are your thoughts about being in an ethnographic museum? Because I think in those days, artists were trying to get out of it, so were curators. And he said, well, I don't feel, I don't feel bad about being here. He says, I said, well, why? He says, well, all my ancestors are here. <laughs> Whereas if I went to the National Gallery, Everyone else's ancestors are there, except yeah. mine, you know, so I, I feel comfortable here. <laughs> and so, um, so we did exhibitions, and I guess in, in a way, I felt uh, as a youngster, I was a Trojan, I was in the Trojan horse, maybe I was a Trojan horse, right? Mm -hmm. And being an institution yeah. to make change, to, to try and uh, uh, bring attention to the artists within the institution, um, maybe make connections with the older pieces, I don't know, but, but that's where we were. That was, that was the reality of a situation we were in the 80s and 90s, you know, and then it changes in the 2000. So maybe my other example is, as Richard said, and I think Richard was a little Trojan <laughs> at the AGO, and then when I came after him, um, I was brought to the Art Gallery of Ontario, which I, I assumed it wasn't that way. I assumed that uh, because of my work over the years uh, that I could bring a new perspective to the kinds of exhibitions, the programming, 
at the Archaeology of Ontario, but at the same time, you kind of feel like a bit of a Trojan mm -hmm. inside these institutions because there's these institutions that we, for so long, have tried to infiltrate, uh, both uh, uh, intellectually as well as artistically, that artists had uh, surely belonged there. So those are the kind of things we, uh, by being at the Archaeology of Ontario, so I think one of the reasons, uh, or sorry, one, um, uh, being at the Archaeology of Ontario at the time um, was important for me because at that point I was told that women were totally underrepresented as well as indigenous artists were underrepresented. So uh, being uh, the head of uh, Canadian art uh, offered me an opportunity to, to change things, okay? So I wasn't just to come in and do another exhibition and follow along the lines of Dennis Reed, for example to lay out Canadian art history since 1867 to today. No, I, I wanted to change all that. I wanted to uh, tell Canada that our art history is 11,000 years, mm -hmm. okay? We had to change something. And so that was the, for me, the kind of uh, situation as an example <laughs> of being a little Trojan maybe. And uh, what's nice about that is that by being an institution such as that, now I'm finding that my successors have taken upon themselves to enact what we had started. Maybe Richard started in his own small way and I broadened it a bit more in Canadian art. And now we're finding uh, the National Gallery, that is changing. So I think we, within our own uh, country of Canada, we are now beginning to see ourselves and perhaps we have put up some kind of mirror in which to see ourselves, not only just indigenous peoples, but all of Canadians and Canadian art. So I think that, that there's a subtlety there, but the Trojan horse story, I'm not sure about that, but <laughs> so I, I used the fort and I think, you know, we weren't just hanging around the fort Indians, and I think that we just starved the institutions into, you know, coming back to us and say, okay, we give up, uh, it's your turn now, and I think that that's the opportunity. We've taken it. Uh, the curators, the artists have definitely got much, much better. Uh, I think the curatorial discourse has actually uh, been very exciting, and I think we've contributed to that. So, um, so whether it's a Trojan horse... Keep in horse, mind, though, Gerald, is that Trojan horse was being pulled into the fort. It was being pulled into the fort? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we watched it, I guess, but we didn't go out. <laughs> well, we... <laughs> We stormed the fort. <laughs> um, in response, not response, but I guess uh, just a couple of ideas <coughs> um, or a couple of thoughts as you were speaking. Um, the first is a story. <laughs> I just opened a show at the Musée des Beaux-Arts um, in November. It's a small bilan, as they say in French. Um, and um, in that exhibition, so it's mostly bodies of old work, except for a, a new series called Code Switching. In that exhibition, um, I really wanted to exhibit an older piece I'd made called Grandmother's Circle, and I asked uh, the curator to um, get borrow the piece, because it's uh, in the collection of the now Canadian Museum of History. And the last time I saw that piece was in 2004 when it was exhibited there. And um, she tried to borrow it, uh, and she ran into some walls. Basically, um, she thought that I had forgotten where the piece was and that it really wasn't there because there's no record of it. And uh, I said, no, no, the piece is really there. You have to go find it. And, and so she you know, rolled up her sleeves and, and tried a little harder. And she did find the piece, and we were, managed to get it in time for the exhibition. But what was interesting is that it was never registered in the CADIC system or whatever the, in the museum inventory list is. And um, it's literally buried in the ethnography section of the museum. Uh, it was purchased in 2005. And so the piece has little ethnographic numbers on each of the sculptural elements. Because oh <laughs> it's not fine art, it's not contemporary art. <laughs> and. Um, I was amazed, <laughs> you know? I was truly, truly amazed. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be with my ancestors, and yet um, that would never have happened in any other context. Um, and so this, 
It's interesting. I, I really, I do like the kind of, the tension of working within ideas of ethnography, museumology. Um, I feel like it provides a really rich and layered kind of way to think about contemporary work. And so, kind of getting back to maybe Kelly's question too about, and Trojan horses, <laughs> Um, I find myself in an interesting time now where quite often um, I'm, my work is put to use and put to other people's use. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that's great and totally agreeable uh, because through it helping kind of to, you know, broaden the colonial construct or think about decolonial gestures um, and other times put to somebody else's use, <laughs> which is, is weird. <laughs> um, but going back to Kelly about uh, the necessity of, of um, international collaborative exchanges, um, I'd like to just kind of put forward, I'm currently working on a project with a collaborative group called Mother Tongue out of Scotland, uh, who are in a way talk, thinking about my art as a way to kind of talk about the colonialism that happened in Scotland and you know I'm looking at clay tobacco pipes as a way of bridging those histories between what's here in North America and indigenous practice here and and all of the kind of tobacco barren cotton barren and sugar barren of you know occupying this territory here and creating at the same time creating wealth and opportunity on the other side Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's, it's great to hear about that project. It, it reminds me of um, uh, something that we've been doing with the Australia Council for the Arts and Creative New Zealand for the last few years. Um, it's called the Tri-Nations Exchange, and it's been bringing together um, in, on, in the visual arts and in the performing arts, uh, indigenous uh, artists, curators, um, producers, uh, presenters, um, to engage in dialogue about what they're doing, uh, what the situation is in their place, um, uh, creating essentially a space uh, for, um, for exchange and collaboration. And for me, it's, a really, it's one of the best things that we've been involved in over the past few years because, um, because it's not about, uh, it's not a Trojan horse. You know, it's not about saying we're, we're going to sort of like invade or, or infiltrate this <laughs> other space with what we think we have to offer and, and it's more about creating um, mutual understanding and um, as I was saying before, a kind of long-term um, deep engagement. So I think, you know, for me the Trojan horse is a terrible metaphor for cultural diplomacy. I think it really, um, it doesn't say anything about the two-way exchange that, that happens, um, that should happen. Um, and you know, for me, it's kind of like it's also similar to the to the notion of soft power, which is also mm -hmm. a term that I don't like because I think, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's I mean, it's a it's a violent metaphor, and it's about mm -hmm. um, it's about a one way one way relationship, which is what which is I think uh, I think we moved past that in terms of our, an understanding mm -hmm. of what cultural diplomacy can be. The Trojan horse wasn't meant to suggest that there's an exchange. What the Trojan horse is meant to address is the fact that in cultural diplomacy, the emphasis has been to date on the diplomacy side of cultural diplomacy. So practitioners of cultural diplomacy are diplomats, not cultural workers. And so the Trojan horse is that often di diplomats and states see themselves as simply sending out artists who are going to go to China, for example, and show Chinese artists who haven't been exposed to Western systems how to best market their art. So as the Canadian state says in 2000, how we can get those Chinese artists to produce their art in such a way that we're not just marketing it to Chinese Canadians. So the Trojan horse is the idea that the state, or the nation state, can willy-nilly just send out artists as though artists are simply agents to be deployed without any sort of agendas of their own in terms of what, as you said, Kelly, the cultural relations that are part of international relations that now more and more are seeming to be more important because they're relational. They have sticking power. They're people-to-people -people diplomacy. So the, as you say, the, there is a, in the exchange, that's the key thing. That's where the power is. It's in that interpersonal interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think about, I mean, ways in which we can uh, uh, 
work with diplomats or work in that cultural diplomacy space the way the council has in some ways yeah. um, to educate them and to, to tra change some of those projects into something that's more worthwhile for artists. Yeah. So I think about, um, I think it was in 2012 when the uh, uh, Canadian consulate in Shanghai uh, accepted to do a Canada focus at the uh, Shanghai International Performing Arts Festival. And they came to us and they said, well, we have some artists in mind. Like, we'd really like to program Celine Dion. And can you help us with that? And we were like, well, no. But what we can do is, like, is suggest to you that there are other kinds of artists and, and uh, people who actually have, um, who we think that the Chinese audience would appreciate and who uh, we would like to um, suggest that you invite to also meet with the Chinese uh, community of artists there, too. And, and you know, and then it was also a conversation about um, about the payment of artist fees and you know proper kind of like a, a, a professional um, uh, setups for their for their performances and it actually ended up being a, a, an interesting um, project. Yeah. Um, but it, it took a long it took a certain amount of energy to to work with the the consulate in Shanghai uh, about what was possible, what they weren't seeing, you know, what could be. You know what could be a um, um, a richer engagement. Mm -hmm. Although I mean, you talk about, and to me, that's exactly what the conversation, in a way, or the question is, because uh, artist fees are related to copyright and exhibition right, which is something that we have here, and not that's not everywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that is an an idea, and um, kind of an idea of of how how things could be. Um, I might, I might just talk about my experience in China. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to go, so I was really excited when I was uh, invited to, uh, to do a project there. Um, but I don't know that it necessarily had uh, specific ties to um, any type of... I'm interested in this discussion, actually, I, I, because to me it, it just felt like it was this other thing that really wasn't uh, part of um, any monies coming from Canada. Um, although we were invited to write grants, um, I don't know that everyone did. And, um, <clears throat> and my experience uh, was that it, it, it was profound because it was the first time where I really felt like my art was in service to something that was n not of my own idea. You know? um, that, uh, that I was incredibly utilized, <laughs> actually. Uh, not for the benefit of my career, but for the benefit of somebody else's career, who I didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was just a whole game. Like, I really saw how my art was played, and, game, and how we were all, all of the Canadian contingent was used. Uh, based on the people they invited, you know, they had all received some sort of award and had some recognition. And, and then the person kind of leading the project was also an artist and it was about her ability to capitalize on us yeah. to better promote herself in China and in Canada. Uh -huh. uh, and it was sick. <laughs> but, um, and I have a lot of really conflicting emotion about that. Although, uh, I really loved my experience of you know, the other experience, the intra, the intra experience of getting to meet some of the other artists and, and meeting other people while I was away and developing relationships with them and understanding a little bit more, um, you know, some of, some of the culture, you know, um, which was um, alien to me. And how and I, I do like those, those connections between people. So understanding how, you know, that, that space, that, that encounter, and how systems of culture are, are different and how they might uneasily rub up against each other. Yeah. So that part I loved. Yeah. But, yeah, those yeah. are really fraught spaces. Well, what I was thinking about when I was thinking about the Trojan horse is more uh, the um, political philosophy of liberalism. And so you send artists in who could work with non-Western artists, but in the course of that exchange, 
They are um, communicating to them Western ways of thinking and understanding notions of what constitutes excellence in art, for example, um, production methods, everything. And so in a way, it's the artist going in and uh, for the state, it's simply a matter of getting its notion of culture and its understanding of culture into another environment. And, and then, as Kelly would say, if it works the way artists want it to work, an exchange happens which in the study of cultural diplomacy hasn't really been studied. The fact that you actually can't just send out artists and expect things to happen the way you direct it. There is an exchange that goes on and what happens there? And how do we best mobilize that to <clears throat> save the world? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we all know this, you know, when you, when you put artists and art out into the world, like it's, it's like you can't, you don't know what that outcome is going to be. It's a it's a living exchange at that point, and yeah, yeah, a means without can end. Have, can have their own intent, but they can only control it yeah. so much. Yeah. In fact, not at all. I think one of the things that interests me in this notion um, is contact, and I think that's what we're talking about. Uh, in many instances, where, uh, as you say, if we're going abroad, uh, but I was thinking of. Uh, just within Canada itself on uh, the arrival of settlers, for example. Um, and uh, that moment of contact created all sorts of situations, you know. Uh, some were uh, uh, anger, <laughs> uh, an outright hostility uh, to wars, to uh, intermarriages. <laughs> And the result was a Métis. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that happened. But you know what else happened was uh, an exchange uh, of critical ideas and of of, of materials, and um, and just seeing each other. I think in 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 different ways. I think the opportunity to trade trade in ideas, trade in materials. Uh, uh, was, was, was to me quite interesting. And I think that's how artists operate today, is, is, is seeing something else, seeing something different, and trying something different. And, and, and I think those moments of contact uh, are, to me, is, is where the creative moment happens. So I'm not interested in, uh, of course, the, the wars, the pestilence, the, uh, you know, those kinds of struggles, but rather, but rather what happens when when people come in contact. And I think that's part of that diplomacy, perhaps, as we see internationally, something really exciting happens. But I, you know, I go back historically, because I'm an art historian to some degree, and I'm interested in what happened uh, uh, at the time here in Canada itself uh, was a result of something quite remarkable. And that's what we see in so-called ethnographic museums. That's an enormous display of, of that creative uh, interaction that happened through history, and uh, and it continues even if your work gets lost in it. <laughs> but uh, but that contact uh, is where artists come. Uh, you know that's where artists find their voice, and I think that that's uh, there shouldn't be a fear in that. And I think that that's really. And if we can, as curators, we can uh, instigate that, that. That all the more better, I think. You know, by taking artists. Uh, in my day, it was taking artists abroad, you know, taking artists to other countries. Nowadays, it's just artists going. You don't need the curator so much, you know? So I think that the artists are perhaps the diplomats in their own way, and cultural diplomats. But I think one time, certainly as curators, we played that role. And I, yeah. When I was younger, I played that role. I don't need to play that role any longer, because I think artists are, uh, are understood and seen, and I think that's an, an exciting time. And I, I think just to interject a bit, at the same time that artists are carrying these very diverse agendas and their agency forward and exchanges, uh, a, a lot of the scholarship that we've been looking at as a group as part of NACTI has to do with um, state projection of identity uh, abroad. And kind of Nadia, as you were mentioning, how artists can get kind of wrapped <laughs> up in that. Uh, and we were reading recently uh, an article by an Australian scholar, uh, David Carter, who uh, was pinpointing Australia's difficulties in projecting their identity abroad, and as he put it, quote, 
Apart from its indigenous culture, it is difficult for Australia to promote an Australian culture in the way that French, Chinese, Japanese, or slightly differently, American governments can. It is no accident, he states, that indigenous culture plays a very large part in Australia's cultural diplomacy programs, end quote. Uh, and, and we were thinking that in some ways the same can be said about Canada and its use of indigenous cultures and arts uh, to project the idea of Canada abroad. Uh, and it, we're just wondering if the panelists might want to speak to this appropriation of indigenous cultures by the settler state and why or why not if you see that happening and, and is it more complicated than that? Richard, do you want to say something since you've been quiet for so long? <laughs> um, um, I guess, I mean, it seems to me what's kind of around this question um, that we're all, we're all struggling with to talk about and think about, but we've all been struggling with it in our careers in different ways, is really, um, I guess, an idea about what the agency of the artist or the curator is. Um, and um, it's something I've <laughs> struggled with a lot. Um, and, and I think about it, you know, it's, not, it's, it's hard not to think about it art historically, um, because we know, we know that we've lived through, or we're either living in or have lived through um, a period when um, the idea of the artist's individual agency has been a very powerful idea. Um, and obviously we also know that it was not always thus. Uh, you know, you were, there was a patron and there was an artist and the artist's job was to serve the patron. Um, and um, I can't help but feel as I'm sitting here looking at Clive um, about the, the history of uh, uh, artist-run culture and all these other things that have tried to uh, kind of center mm -hmm. Um, artists' uh, agency around the um, uh, the exhibition of their art, um, you know, so that so that it can kind of support what the artist project is, um, and in a way, um, you know, this is also a phenomenon that's it goes hand in hand with the in a way the kind of rise of the middle class and uh, the power of professions, um, and so I, I I can't help but see all those things together, and one of the things that has caused me enormous anxiety. I know now I'm going off your question, I'm That's sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but in terms of how you subvert things, uh, you know, the, the question is always like kind of what power do you have in that situation mm -hmm. and how do, you, how do you turn it the way you want it to go? Um, and um, I guess to get back to the AGO and you know, our kind of very different experiences there, um, um, I think one of the, th the thing that I learned at the AGO, maybe it was the wrong thing to learn, it was just a bad set of circumstances, maybe it was even totally unusual, but um, uh, my project there was going to be to do what you did. <laughs> that was what I wanted to do. I was so excited about it, and we did one, one, one gallery, because we had no money, and um, so we, we had some money to do one gallery, and we did it as a kind of pilot project, and we did the most extreme sort of thing we could think of, um, and I'm proud of it. Um, but what happened after that was that uh, Ken Thompson swooped in on the AGO, uh, or the AGO swooped in on him. Who knows who was, uh, <laughs> I think Ken, Ken Thompson was the one swoop. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but what happened, the, the short version of that story is, um, you know, I come into the institution at the moment, Dennis Reed had been made chief curator. He had been, he had wanted indigenous art in the Canadian collection for two decades, I think, and had never been, you know, I mean, as even as curator of Canadian art, it had not been able to feel that he could achieve that. He was finally chief curator. Uh, Matthew Teitelbaum wanted that to happen. The whole institutional culture wanted it, not the whole institution, the marketing still could, would just say, oh, we don't know how to sell a show on indigenous art, so. Uh, and, uh, and the fundraising people would always say, oh, we can't, no one will give money for that, we don't, anyway. Um, but the reason I mention those people, of course, is they're very powerful people in the institution. Uh, people have an idea that curators are powerful forces in museums these days, and that may or may not be true, uh, depending on the situation. <coughs> but what happened with Ken Thompson is, um, you know, we were making plans to gradually change the entire Canadian wing to include indigenous art all throughout it. Um, we wrote uh, uh, policy documents, you know, so we got it in writing. If I thought, well, this is like a real achievement. <laughs> uh, and uh, all of a sudden, Ken Thompson came in and said, I want to, you know, I'm going to maybe give this work to the AGO. And 
Um, they started making deals and suddenly the federal government was involved with the Triple P thing, uh, super build project. Um, and Frank Gehry was involved as the architect. Uh, and Ken, what, what, what I was hearing at every meeting we went to is that Ken Thompson didn't want indigenous art in his part of the Canadian wing. Um, so we had like policy we created, the whole, intellectually we were all on board in terms of the people who were supposedly the, you know, kind of guiding the exhibition there. Um, and then all of a sudden one rich guy came in and said, no, you can't, uh, that's not going to happen. You can do it over here, but in my new suite of galleries it's going to be all uh, non-indigenous artists. Um, and I realized at that point, belatedly, stupidly, I was naively protected, I think, by Dennis's support of the project up till then, um, I realized that the institution did, wasn't running for artists, it was running for the rich guys who, uh, who, were, uh, who were on the board and who, were, um, who, who that institution was created by and who it still served primarily. And, um, and so I just walked away from that project because it looked hopeless at that point. Um, then Ken Thompson died and um, I guess his son was not so... Uh, adamantly against having, or actually, I don't know, some, I, I went to the opening and suddenly there was indigenous art in the Thompson Galleries. Um, so, um, but, but I, the thing that I walked away from that with was um, the idea about, uh, you know, I had this kind of imaginary, I had this thought that it was like, this was happening as a, as a way of changing ideas. And maybe it has, maybe the ideas are changing and, you know, it's gonna catch up eventually. But there was also this kind of raw economic power that was being exercised in that situation um, that seemed to be the real reality of what the place was and that, you know, that there was this kind of epiphenomenal thing happening which happened to be art. Um, and <coughs> it, it struck me ever since then that I've really been trying to figure out like what's, what is my position in this economic si situation, you know, what, what am, what am I going to have to do to to make something work. And in so many parts of the art world, there's a very disgusting <laughs> economic conditions that apply. Um, and they create all kinds of situations where artists, um, you know, in a way, almost have to kind of struggle to preserve the illusion of their own autonomy, right? Um, <clears throat> sorry to put it that way. Um, but I think we need to, you know, try to be honest about that as well, in, uh, you know, to the extent that we can. Um, you, you can see why I'll never be hired back at the HEO. <laughs> um, um, but I was, I was really excited. I really wanted to uh, do stuff. But anyway, um, so I, I think that, that really put me on a, a track to thinking about this kind of relationship between, uh, you know, to put it in crudely Marxist terms, economic base and cultural superstructure. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and to really kind of always be looking at that. And, and I really wonder now, because of the economic polarization that has sped up enormously in the past few decades, um, if artists are going to be able to maintain that autonomy against just this, the kind of superpower that the rich are aggregating to themselves um, right now, I think it's going to be an enormous challenge uh, to not end up being back as, uh, you know, kind of court painters or something like that. Uh, uh, I'm, that's a totally cynical version. I, I, I hold hope. I'm naturally optimistic, but I'm also naturally fearful. So. <laughs> <coughs> Um, you mentioned something about Australia yes. and as a, uh, as a way in which Australia and Australians are, I think Canadians are like that, mm -hmm. right? I think that that's what we're in a situation where, can't, uh, you know, I used to hear kind of grumblings within the Canadian art world about the very same thing in terms of you know, it's all the indigenous artists that are getting the attention. <laughs> um, and, and I was thinking about the, the strength of Australia, and I think that that's what he was referring to about, about the identity of Australian Aboriginal art. Uh, and, and, and I think Canada has used uh, indigenous art to the same degree, you know, about marketing, uh, these very strong identifiers, uh, visual identifiers. You know, we know uh, in Australia there's the central desert dot painters. They do the big, big, big paintings, you know, and we've seen those internationally. I think there was a big exhibit a few years ago at the Ludwig Museum in, uh, in Cologne. Uh, there's the, 
uh, the northern, what they call uh, uh, the bark painters, and they uh, work on poles. So these are images that the visual nature, the visuality is so, uh, so strong, you know, and, that, and so ancient. And so in some ways they've traded on that, on those images, and I think those ideas of, of indigeneity, so it's become uh, an opportunity, and I think that that's how the country trades. For us, I think there's a similar opportunity, a similar pattern, you know, Northwest Coast, very strong, it's internationally known. Uh, Inuit art, I think uh, Norman Brown's talked about Inuit art to some degree, and some great papers about how it's used internationally to sell our country. Um, Morisot and his uh, legend painters, very strong visually. So I think that the, uh, our history uh, and our identity is, 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 is seen through the, those lenses, you know, those kind of stereotypical lenses of totem poles and, 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 and igloos, et cetera. So it's easy to, to see how Canadian artists would, would look at that and go, my God, this is so terrible. You know, that's what Canadian art is and that's how we bring market it. But at the same time, I think indigenous artists are looking at that and say, well, it is who we are. It is, a, it is, it is what is from here. It is what it's indigenous. So I think trying to figure that out in terms of uh, how Canadian artists, indigenous artists, uh, you know, do, do we trade on our identities or how do, it, it's being traded, uh, it's not that we do it, not as, but it's, it's somehow there's some institutions and I think Richard was talking about it to some degree how uh, some of the wealthy will trade on that or not, you know, and I think in some cases, I think the elder uh, Ken Thompson, despite the fact that he had a large collection, I think his younger uh, son was the one that looked at it in a very different way. I think he, they perhaps traded on it slightly differently, but, but how do we, how does the, uh, uh, both the, the wealthy patron versus the government of Canada trade on those identities for us, you know, and I think that that's, to me, an interesting uh, discussion about about that about how our art is used you know um, some of us are happy some of us are not you know and I think that that to the degree that Canadian uh, 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 the field of Canadian art is I was just talking to a young gentleman the other day about uh, uh, he said uh, he works for Canadian art magazine and he was saying that you know, Canadian art magazine is not as well known outside of Canada as C Magazine is, for example, you know? And he was probably, he was saying that uh, it's probably because C doesn't really mean much, you know? So it can sort of travel around the world, you know? Whereas Canadian art, it's already stereotyped by Canadians, so nobody wants to read that. You know? so, so I'm wondering about the same thing about, you know, trading on these kind of identities to me is an interesting kind of situation and discussion, you know, that, that is only beginning to be understood. And I think uh, Canada has a long history of trading on indigenous identity, certainly with the Indian War Arts since the 50s. Um, and it's still there, you know. Um, Inuit are still practicing their work, you know, in the communities at home, and indigenous artists and the South First Nations artists are slightly different. And, uh, but nonetheless, I think, you know, when we think of this summer, I was at Documenta. I noticed that uh, uh, the late the, uh, the late Bo Dick, his work was just, you know, when we look at his art, we see it's it's so very traditional. You know, it's so grounded in the community, and that uh, at one time that was seen so negatively as ethnographic. So now you see uh, curators around the world, you know, at Documenta being attracted to that, people are attracted to that. There's so the question is why? Is there a, a kind of a still a sense of an interest in what we used to ter term primitivism in the 80s, you know, and, and pr previous, is, there, is that another way that these identities are being traded on in, in today in terms of contemporary artists and indigenous art in particular? I don't know, I was just some interesting questions I thought that you had started. That's an interesting question, I think um, also, uh, when you were talking, I was just thinking that um, there are so many players out there right now in the, in the world. And like when you were talking about um, how artists don't necessarily need curators anymore to make connections and travel and, and work internationally, I think you know uh, um, 
They also don't need the government to do that, don't need the government to frame their images or frame their, their output. And um, there is a, a huge interest in indigenous work internationally. And, and people and presenters and institutions that are willing to, to um, meet that work on its own terms. And uh, I think it raises some interesting uh, questions for, for Canada in terms of how we, you know, how, uh, what, uh, the image of Canada that's being projected internationally in a good way. Well, I think the economic role in that, again, is also, uh, I'm so, in terms of the thing that you're talking about, Gerald, um, with Inuit art, say, um, in a way that was, you know, Inuit art, as we know, it was a market phenomena. <coughs> it wasn't a traditional culture phenomena. Um, Northwest Coast art, as we know it, is a bit of both. There's certainly a huge, huge market out there that's, um, you know, that's, been uh, had a big influence on what what has come to be north you know the the the, the idea of what northwest coast art is um, and again I, I to me it's always this kind of shifting target right um, you can when you start to subvert what that expectation is as an artist um, there's a moment that's opened up for reconsideration so when someone like Annie Puttagook or many other uh, Uva Lutanili or other people, uh, even Apache Puttagook, started doing work that was not catering to those expectations. There was this moment where um, you had to think about that work differently, and, and it started to reveal the, you know, the kind of system of its own production and what life in Nunavut is like now. Um, and that's a great moment. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like, well, then that can start to be fetishized, right? You can start to um, uh, that can start to become too easy and too comfortable, and everyone can start to feel quite smug about. Um, feeling like, well, we've kind of deconstructed Inuit art and, it, and, and yet it's kind of still carrying on in, in the way that it has. Um, so I, I think to me that's always this kind of back and forth of how you, you catch what that situation is at a, per, a moment. You try to have, you know, all the, you know, you, you need such critical faculties to kind of be able to see through all those layers and then um, and try to make an intervention in what that moment is, and then the next intervention might have to be something really different, and then the next one might have to be something really different. So there are moments when it's extremely valuable to kind of take a very hard line stand on culture and kind of project yourself as a, you know, this is our culture, as though we all know what it is, and it's this perfectly <laughs> clear thing. Um, and then there are other moments where it's just really valuable to kind of step back and say, well, Okay, maybe, but what about this? And you know, uh, I think that's a, that's kind of the struggle every artist is in, in a way. Um. Isn't isn't there a game show where someone says something and then the contestant gives the question that goes with it? <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to give the wrap-up question, which Richard has just answered. But in any case, <laughs> I'll I'll give the question and then we'll play to the rest. Thank you, though. It, yeah. Okay. So yes, no, it's a great segue, because we wanted to end by asking you, you know, if you're in an environment uh, where it, that might be seeking to um, celebrate your inclusion, how do you as an activist, whether an artist, an artist administrator, a curator, or a critic, how do you advance an activist agenda in that context? Um, how do you work against that? Um, there's been some frustration that, that a couple of you have, have uh, demonstrated here of feeling as though you're being contained by that very thing. So how do you advance uh, those agendas in that environment that's celebrating you perhaps for other reasons than are yours? Luckily, the thing that I was gonna kind of talk to you <laughs> in response to Richard also uh, answers this. <laughs> Um, you know, I guess I'm here to talk about the practice and my practice, and uh, and so um, and this also speaks to you know that other uh, larger question of uh, success and how do you serve community and and how do you remain political in those moments? And you know, sometimes the answers, I mean, that they are like how Richard described, you know, they're um, moment by moment or situation by situation, and uh, sometimes those things come effortlessly, and other times uh, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> I found myself in a situation this summer um, where I was included in a group show in, in Katano called Endless Landscape, and um, it was very, very difficult for me to figure out 
what I was doing there and what my project was supposed to be. Um, and there was lots of money. So it wasn't about production, it was about context. Yeah. And, um, you know, in that situation, uh, here I was, uh, indigenous artist, Algonquin artist from the territory of, you know, Ottawa River Valley. And, um, and my other colleagues were, uh, you know, just guys mostly. <laughs> Uh, operating in a whole different context of just being able to do their thing yeah. and uh, and the, the exhibition space was um, um, an in-use soccer indoor soccer field so there are three soccer fields and a basketball court so a huge space that used to be a foundry um, but now for the summer months because it was summer you know people don't play soccer in, indoor it's too hot and so it was always like the dream of um, Stéphane Saint Laurent, who had been, who would key organizer for Max Neo set to do this exhibition. And so, well, what am I doing as the indigenous artist in this space, which is uh, about games, <laughs> about like sport, um, to, to represent? I, I felt like I really had to represent actually. Um, and there was, the production was, there was like quite a bit of money. So much money, in fact, that one of the ideas I wanted to consider was to purchase a parking space from a new development site just down from where the exhibition was happening um, called, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about the condo, the ZB project. Um, well, there's a, there's a whole, con I'm trying to remember West, I'm trying to remember all the names, but anyway, a condo development site on Victoria Island uh, or a, a Victoria, Shaojir Falls, right? And in a way to remember uh, that we're on unceded Algonquin land, they were calling it Le Breton Flat, near Le Breton Flats, yeah. calling it ZB, which is uh, the Algonquin word for water. Um, and so within this condo project, well, I couldn't afford a condo, but maybe I could have afforded a parking spot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, that was too, that was complicated because of course there was money but there was no time uh, to kind of find the lawyers and find the realtor to kind of go through that process. Um, but I, I feel like it would have been more lasting. Um, so instead I felt like I had to talk about the situation. And so how do you create like political work in a space that's not supposed to be political? Uh, <laughs> I, anyway, I, <laughs> I could talk a little bit more about the project, but I won't. Um, I'll just end with um, turned into a poster project where people could uh, take a poster away for a small contribution and that those monies that were collected uh, would go back into the communities um, at, uh, um, in Kitigan ZV. I said earlier the kind of... Uh situation that as a young curator I found myself in in terms of, of a museum in terms of the uh, activists politically engaged artists of the 80s and 90s and the kind of things that we were doing um, but it's quite the, the departure today is is uh, equally or more interesting I find um, and your work, for example, uh, the SCAR project that you did a few years ago, are you all familiar with the SCAR project in which Nadia uh, had people create, uh, I think you, I don't know if you tore the canvases and people were asked to uh, sew it back up and, and uh, to uh, talk about their own scars, you know, and often the case was, so, uh, was something quite psychological and it, the engagement in that discussion I thought was really quite remarkable. And uh, to me, that was, that's exciting today and thinking about, uh, uh, and I think a lot of indigenous artists and just artists in general are engaged in a socially, uh, socially engaged practice, right? And uh, to me, uh, it encourages a kind of, uh, of, a, of a recovery of something that we lost. And it's, it's, it's a way of looking uh, for us and for indigenous artists, for example, it might be about uh, indigenous knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge uh, that, that has been uh, 
removed or taken away through, uh, through the imposition of the residential school systems, for example. And so the loss of this tremendous amount of, of knowledge, I think, is now uh, there. And I think through social engagement by the artists is looking at that in new ways. You know, um, artists looking at uh, language, for example, or looking at uh, using traditional materials, looking at medicines, you know, in the work of Christy Belcourt, who's examining medicines through paintings, you know, uh, through uh, doctors, indigenous doctors who are uh, looking at medicines by talking to elders from across the country or by, uh, there was some gentleman by the name of uh, Volant, I can't remember, Stanley Volant, I believe in, in, in uh, Quebec, who uh, walked for thousands of kilometers, you know, from, through different indigenous communities, talking to elders, and he was a, he was a surgeon himself, talking to elders and uh, uh, trying to understand medicines, you know. Through, so through just by talking and walking, trying to recover these stories and getting back to the, uh, really I think an interesting social engaged practice in his instance. He's, an, he's a doctor, but I think artists are taking to that, you know. So I think to, there's an activism that is critical here and that recovery of, of what has been stolen or taken away, you know what I mean? Uh, and so uh, that's what I see, I think, in where we're going towards. That's what excites me, anyhow. And I think that that's just another turn, if you will, about how contemporary art practice is taking us. And I'm quite excited by what these young people are doing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, on that note, this is a great time uh, to thank everybody for braving the storm, to, for being here with us today. And I'd like you to join me in sincerely thanking our panelists for sharing such great thoughts and ideas with us this afternoon.